Uh, let's for this afternoon. Let's all turn our Bibles to First Peter chapter three. First Peter chapter three. As you all know, I have begun a series of messages through this book of First Peter. Uh, for today, I'm jumping over to chapter three of the book, though, because I want to focus in today on a specific topic that Peter touches on here. Brother Jade came to this passage first hour and brought a message that was a great segue into the message I have for you second hour. He actually, as I mentioned, stole some of my thunder first hour, but that's okay. In fact, it's great. I just want you all to know, however, that Brother Jade and I did not compare notes before the meeting. The Holy Spirit just works like that, I believe. As mentioned, I'm coming to this chapter because I want to focus in on a specific topic that Peter touches on here, and Jay touched on it first hour also. That being our duty to speak up for Jesus and to magnify Him. And one way we do that is by defending the faith from those who attack it. And by the way, all around us these days, of course, are people who attack our faith, various religions, atheists, etc. I'll remind us all that except for just a few verses in chapter 5, where Peter specifically addresses church elders. First Peter is a general epistle written to all Christians in general. With that reminder in view, I want us to notice what Peter says to all Christians, to each one of us, therefore, in verse 15 of 1 Peter chapter 3, where he says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. This is something that each one of us has a calling and a responsibility under God to do. Peter writes this to every Christian. We all have this responsibility and duty. And if there's anyone here who sees no point or who has no interest in being ready always to give an answer to every man, that has to you a reason of the hope that is in you. I'd say that person needs to question his salvation to see if he's truly in the faith because this is a command that we have and those who love the Lord want to obey His commands. We often hear this verse cited in reference to our duty to witness to others. But it's almost always cited by itself and yanked out of context. While the context here in the verses both before and after verse 15 is not about nice people who innocently and curiously ask us about our faith. All right, That's not what Peter's talking about here. And by the way, how often does that ever happen anyway? How often do people come up and ask you to share your faith with them? Right? It doesn't happen very often. Instead, the context here is about how to respond when our faith is under attack from unbelievers and persecutors. Peter says in verse 14, But if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are you. Happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Then he says, but instead, rather than being afraid of their terror, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Not fear of man, but fear of God. Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation, your good conduct in Christ. Peter says, verse 17, For it is better if the will of God be so, that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. And better, much better that we suffer for preaching the gospel than for doing evil. And so again, the context here is about how to respond when our faith is under attack from unbelievers and persecutors, when we are in situations that might cause us to want to clam up and remain silent rather than speaking up as we are exhorted here and encouraged to do. To all of us, Peter says here in verse 15 that there are Two things every Christian is called upon to do when in that circumstance. First, Peter says that we are to sanctify the Lord God in our hearts. And secondly, Peter says we are to be ready to defend the faith from those who attack it. In this first statement here, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Peter is actually displaying his knowledge of the Old Testament by continuing a reference back to the Old Testament prophet Isaiah that he started here in the latter half of verse 14, where Peter says, And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. He's quoting here from Isaiah chapter 8, where we read in verse 12, Say ye not a confederacy to all them 
whom this people shall say a confederacy, neither fear ye their fear, nor be afraid. Then Isaiah says, verse 13 of chapter 8, Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself, and let him be your fear, let him be your dread. And so that's really the point Peter is making here. Don't be afraid of those who persecute you or attack your faith. Instead, use the opportunity to witness to them. That's what Peter is saying here. In the context here of suffering for righteousness' sake, both in verse 14 and 16, Peter says in verse 15 that we are not to fear men, but instead we are to fear God alone. And we are thereby to sanctify or to set apart the Lord of hosts. And that means the Lord Jesus, may I say. The Lord of hosts in the Old Testament is the Lord Jesus. We're to set him apart as a focus, the central message of our lives, as our first love, meaning the one that we love more than everything else in this life. And as Jade said, first hour, we have to prioritize magnifying Christ above everything else in this life. That's what Peter means here by sanctify the Lord of hosts himself. As such, Jesus is to be our only fear and our only dread. Each one of us should fear and we should dread disappointing our Lord and our Savior by remaining silent when we know we have to speak up to defend and proclaim His truth. We're to sanctify Him in our hearts by preparing ourselves to do precisely that, to proclaim His holiness, His deity, and His sovereignty, to reveal Him as the one who rules and reigns in the universe. That's how we magnify Him, as Paul said there, In Philippians chapter 1. This is what Peter means by sanctifying the Lord God in our hearts. So in that context, then Peter then says, And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And that means, again, not with any fear of man, but fearing God alone. Peter is saying here that we are not to shrink back from our duty to proclaim the gospel due to any fear of man or due to any fear of persecution. Instead, we are to fear God alone and we're to be far more concerned with the consequences of disobeying His command to preach the gospel to every creature than we are with man's reaction to what we preach. And so we should always be ready to defend our faith from those who attack it or come against it. As Brother Jade said, first hour, we magnify Christ by speaking the word, by preaching Christ, by defending the gospel, even among those who are hostile to the gospel. Turn over a few pages to the right to the epistle of Jude. First Peter says that we should be ready always to defend our faith from those who attack it or come against it. And then here in the book of Jude, another general epistle that's sent to all Christians in general, we're called upon to not only be defenders of the faith, but we're also to be contenders for the faith. Contenders for the faith. Jude 1. Verse 1, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called, mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Jude says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that, this is the first thing Jude says, that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. This is first and foremost in Jude's mind here. I got to write to you and exhort you to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. This is to every Christian again. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ, as many of the cults do today. We see in verse 1 that like Peter, Jude also writes to all them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. He's not writing just to preachers and teachers and theologians. He's writing to all Christians in general. And he says that we are all called to earnestly contend for the faith. And that word earnestly means that we are to take this calling seriously and, in fact, zealously intensely to contend earnestly means to fight zealously wholeheartedly for the true christian faith some people criticize us for being fighters well jude says fight wholeheartedly for the faith we are to be fighters i'd like to ask how many of us here can honestly say we take this verse seriously and do our best to measure up to it 
How many of us are earnest contenders for the truth, for the true faith, once delivered to the saints? Every Christian is called upon to be ready to both defend and contend for his faith to those who would attack it. And not only to be on the defense, but also to go on the offensive as well. We're under command of the Lord Jesus to be confrontational soul winners, to confront people with their need to be saved with the glorious light of the gospel. To do so, every Christian is therefore called upon to be growing in the faith and learning the Bible to the point where he can do so. As Paul says in Ephesians 6, we are to have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, meaning we are to be prepared to preach the gospel, meaning it's my job to prepare you. Now that concludes the expository portion of this message. Now comes the practical application. Open your Bibles, Isaiah chapter 43 and John chapter 1. We'll get there pretty soon. Isaiah 43 and John chapter 1. For today, to help us be obedient to the calling we see in these verses, I'm bringing a somewhat condensed and simplified lesson on how to earnestly contend with some of the most contentious purveyors of false gospel on the planet, who regularly, as part of their religion, go door to door spreading their false gospel of damnation, that being members of the cult organization known as the Watchtower Society, in other words, those who falsely, fraudulently call themselves Jehovah's Witnesses, but who I prefer to call simply JWs or FJWs, a.k.a. false Jehovah's Witnesses. I've addressed the topic in the past, but I've bogged us down in too much information and materials that could not be readily absorbed or implemented without lots of study. And actually that most JWs under normal circumstances would not take time to address anyway. So for today, I've formulated a simpler three or four point approach to try to make the most impact in the short time that we may have to get these people to realize they have been lied to by their cult when they come to our doors or when we meet them out in the public square. The message today is actually inspired by three recent events that cropped up. First, a week and a half ago, Brother Will sent me an email asking for some good Bible verses to use in witnessing the Jehovah's Witnesses. And then last Wednesday, Brother Jade sent a few of us a text saying he actually got a JFW to take a gospel track from him. And then Saturday, PJ said he had done the same thing. So they got them to finally take tracks, which they've been forbidden to do by their cult in the past. And you guys can share your experiences here later after the message with us. But so based on that inspiration, I was really just prompted to come back to this topic today to give us all some ammunition to use against these folks, as they are probably one of the most difficult types of deceived people to witness to, who in their doctrine most certainly qualify as those who deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ, as Jude said. They deny the deity of Christ. They deny the bodily resurrection of Christ. They deny both the deity and the personhood of the Holy Spirit. They deny that all believers go to heaven after this life. They, in essence, preach a false gospel of salvation by works. And just in case some of us here may be thinking that you're not personally called upon to go out and witness to Jehovah's Witnesses. The fact is that you probably won't need to because they'll probably come to your door instead. And when they do, in light of what Peter says here in 1 Peter 3.15, we must be ready always to give an answer. And so we all need to be armed with the truth to resist the false gospel of damnation that the FJWs bring with them. First, I want to bring a little bit of background and some history of the Watchtower cult. The sect known today as the Jehovah's Witnesses as one of the many rotten fruit products that emerged in the late 1800s from the great falling away and the apostasy that actually began with the higher criticism movement and its attack on the authority of the scriptures, resulting then in the production of the Westcott and Hort Greek New Testament text. Both the JWs and the Seventh-day Adventists, or the SDA cult that we've talked about in the past, they both came out of the Millerite movement after what was called the Great Disappointment when Jesus did not return in power and glory in 1884, as William Miller had calculated. He repented of that and went back to being a Baptist, but those other cults didn't. The JWs in particular are also the direct product of the publication of the highly corrupted Westcott and Hort text, which they then further corrupted to produce their completely perverted Watchtower translation, their Watchtower Bible. The JW started out in Pennsylvania in 1870, as a supposed Bible class led by a man named Charles Taze Russell, who named his little group the Millennial Dawn Bible Study, 
Russell began writing a series of books called Millennial Dawn, which stretched to six volumes before his death and actually contained much of the false theology that Jehovah's Witnesses now hold to. The Watchtower Bible and Tract Society was then founded in 1886 and quickly became the vehicle through which the Millennial Dawn movement began distributing their views to others. After uh, Charles Taze Russell died in 1916, Judge J.F. Rutherford, Russell's friend and successor, wrote the seventh and final volume of the Millennial Dawn series. He titled it The Finished Mystery in 1917. The group was known as the Russellites until 1931, when due to a split in the organization, it was renamed the Jehovah's Witnesses. False Jehovah's Witnesses as we know them. The Watchtower is Bible. The New World Translation, or NWT, was produced during the Watchtower presidency of Nathan Knorr in 1942 to 1977. And this translation was allegedly produced to, quote, restore the name Jehovah in the Old Testament, where the Hebrew name uh, YHWH, or yod heh rod heh appears. Uh, it's always rendered Lord in the KJV, except seven places where the context demands its inclusion, where it does say Jehovah. This name was also inserted 237 times in the New Testament, uh, New World Translation, 237 times in the New Testament where the text refers to the Father, despite the fact that this change blatantly contradicted thousands of available ancient Greek manuscripts. Nowhere in those texts do you find the name Jehovah. The New World Translation uses it as its Greek text the same perverted Westcott Hort Greek text used by the NIV, the New American Standard, and all the other recent perversions of the scriptures, as they do admit right in their preface. And as we know, this Greek text, which was compiled by two about spiritualists who dabbled in the occult, they were closet Catholics. This text deletes from the original text in over 6,000 places. We cover all that course in detail on our King James Bible page. So the translators of the New World Translation took an already corrupted text and further distorted it, producing a radically biased and deliberate distortion of God's word to promote their own cultic agenda. The society publicly resisted naming the New World Translation's translators because they wanted to hold them up as prophets. But a high-level defector named Raymond Franz did identify them in his book, Crisis of Conscience, when he repented of all this. He identified them as Nathan Knorr, Frederick Franz, Albert Schroeder, George Genghis, and Milton Henschel. None of whom, none of whom were qualified translators, none of whom had any, any education in, in the languages. Four of the five had no Greek or Hebrew training at all and had only graduated from high school. They inserted what they wanted the Bible to say literally into their New World Translation. Franz claimed to know Hebrew and Greek, but then under oath in open court in Scotland, he failed a simple Hebrew test. He had dropped out of college his sophomore year without studying anything relating to the Bible. This is, these are the translators of the New World Translation. As for their beliefs, JWs believe that Jesus is Michael the Archangel, the highest created being, which of course contradicts many scriptures that plainly declare Jesus to be absolute, infinite God. Uh, they reject the Trinity, believing Jesus to be a, a created being, be, and they believe the Holy Spirit to essentially be the inanimate power of God, not a person. They deny the person of the Holy Spirit, they believe salvation is obtained by a combination of faith, good works, and obedience, which, as we know, contradicts many scriptures that declare salvation to be received by grace through faith alone. JWs also reject the concept of Christ's substitutionary atonement. Instead, they hold to a ransom theory that Jesus' death was a ransom payment for Adam's sin only. They reject the King James Bible as authority, of course, claiming the English Bible was corrupted over the centuries, and so they produced a Bible of their own discussed already. They consider use of the name Jehovah essential for proper worship. And they're also famous for refusing military service and blood transfusions. I personally first determined to learn how to respond to JWs about four years or so after I got saved when some JWs came to my door in Tampa and I just was not well prepared to refute their error. I knew they were wrong but I didn't really know how to refute them and so I remembered that my grandma had said you can't reason with these people. You can't get anywhere with them, so just tell them to go away and bother somebody else. And that's the attitude and the view of most Christians, I would say. I would not accept defeat, and I don't see that as all, at all as being a proper 
biblical Christian attitude. And so I determined to learn how to respond when those people came to my door. I actually picked up a book at the time uh, that was put out by a married couple that were former JWs. I had heard uh, them on a radio, Christian radio program saying that the best way to witness the JWs is to first attack their source by pointing out the many false prophecies uttered by the Watchtower Society. As former JWs, they had access to JW materials, and they included copies of the JW's own statements containing false prophecies from their publications, which then I have also included as exhibit to the handout I have for you today, and that I'll be putting up on the screen in a moment. When I last addressed this issue, I suggested seven broad issues to try to address with JWs. It was too much to, to take in. It was too, too much to try to present when you confront them. Those seven issues are, one, the Watchtower Society does not speak for God. Two, the New World Translation is a deliberate deception, which it is. Three, Jehovah is not God's only name, and it's not. Four, salvation is by grace through faith alone, not of man's works or efforts. Five, the biblical God is a trinity. Arguments for that. Six, Jesus is Jehovah. And then seven of all, seventh, uh, there is one people of God, not two peoples, but two different destinies. These are all issues that you can take up with them if you have family members who are JWs. They're all valid points. But you're never going to get through all those without lots of study beforehand and without arguing and contending with the JW for several hours, which typically is not going to happen unless you're dealing with family members. For those situations, I do still have all these points covered. On a separate handout, I'm going to, uh, I'll just show you briefly today and I'll send you all by email after the meeting today. I don't want to get bogged down on all this today for which we have no time. So for today, I've narrowed this all down to quick, uh, three quick talking points and uh, parting thought to get across to JWs that you can actually easily point out in five or ten minutes if you have to. You can also greatly elaborate on with what I'm giving you today over, over uh, several minutes or a half hour or whatever, as much time as I'll give you. I'm going to state these three points briefly and I'll come back to address each one. Point one is that the FJWs have been deceived by false prophets, frauds, and liars who have issued multiple false prophecies of predicted events that did not come to pass and that have also intentionally corrupted the Bible. That's point one to get across to them. Obviously, this point needs to be approached somewhat strategically and tactfully, but that should be addressed first in order to disarm them and hopefully make them want to hear more. That's my hope. Uh, I have a handout for you guys with 22 exhibits from their own Watchtower publications proving that the organization claims to be God's prophet in the earth today, or they claimed, and the, they claim to be the only organization with authority from God to properly interpret the Bible. And I've also included 18 of their false prophecies or confirmations of such false prophecies that never came to pass. Uh, for instance, the society, Watchtower Society falsely prophesied in 1889 that the battle of the great day of God Almighty of Revelation 16:14 had already begun and would end in the year 6, uh, 1914. That in that year, the kingdom of God would replace all earthly governments, 1914. In 1916, they backed off of that, and they, but they prophesied that in 1925, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would be resurrected and would live in the mansion that they had built in San Diego. They prophesied that. In 1942, they prophesied that Armageddon would take place within months. And in 1968, they prophesied that the end of the age would occur in 1975 and the millennial reign of Christ would begin. They claimed at that time, quote, there were only about 90 months or seven and a half years left before 6,000 years of man's existence on earth is completed. And in 1974, the society actually condoned member preparations for the end of the age I told them they can go ahead and sell all earthly possessions and make special sacrifices to the organization. These and other false declarations are all proven by the handout I'm going to look at in a moment. So again, point one is that they have been deceived by false prophets, frauds, and liars. Point two is uh, that JW is, well, they say they believe in only one God. If their Bible is right, then they actually are polytheists who have to believe in multiple gods. That's point two today. I'll come back to point three then is that Jesus is Jehovah. And unless they repent and believe that, they are in fact, as Jesus said, dead in their sins and on their way to hell. We'll come back to these one by one. 
as with Mormons, JWs that come to your door will no doubt be very well trained in their own doctrine and their talking points. They tend to be very elusive and quick to change the subject when they're cornered. And so you have to keep them on point, keep bringing them back to the point. They're not nearly as polite and respectful as Mormons, and they have been brainwashed to be very resistant and to reject reading materials from outside their organization. That may be changing now since both Brother Jade and PJ got them to take a couple of tracks recently. Coming back to point one and the approach I recommend with these people, as I suggested with Mormons, I would recommend starting from the position that you are a Christian, but that you're open to correction in your doctrine and you never want to reject anything that the Lord wants you to learn. So try to express an open-mindedness. Don't go hostile with them. Tell them you've been given some of their publications that you have questions about, and I recommend. I've got some of your publications I've got some questions about. That's the truth. And then I encourage you to invite them to sit down with you and talk about it. Some understandably refuse to invite JWs to come into their house, citing 2 John 1, 10 to 11, where John said, If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed. For he that biddeth him God speed is partaker of his evil deeds. In my opinion, and that of many others I've, I've consulted, John is here speaking about forbidding, admitting unsaved heretics into the church, the house of God. But just as the Lord Jesus ate with sinners and tax collectors, and he also went to the house of the Pharisee to sup with him, as Paul said, he would become all things to all men, and he might by all means win some. Unless the weather is nice and there's someplace outside that you can sit down with them, I recommend inviting them into your house, have them sit down, and then you have a slightly more captive audience, and you can address some issues with them. At that point, you're going to want to have... Uh, you need to have handy a couple of copies of this document. I'm going to put up on the screen now. And by the way, for those listening to the message online, since the document's file size is too large to post to our sermon audio page, to get a copy of this, you'll need to send us an email requesting a link to the document so you can download it from our online storage drive. Hopefully you guys can all see that. This is the document I have for you. I've changed the title. First page is about the same as it was before. This handout is going to have two introductory pages printed front and back of one paper stapled in front of 22 exhibits taken from various Watchtower publications. Tell the JW that you understand from these Watchtower publications that the Society has made several false prophecies and false claims to be God's prophet in the earth and that you'd like to know what they think about that. As much as they will allow you to do so, go through this document with them. And again, this is a much improved uh, version from the last one. So the first page here has a synopsis of the exhibits. In order to avoid rabbit trails, I'm going to say skip the first two pages, actually, and just tell them the first page is just a listing of the exhibits and go directly to the exhibits, to which I have now actually, you can read through this, but I've now actually added, first of all, I found a better copy of this, much better copy of this page from their actual document. This is from... Uh, the Watchtower version of April 70, 1972. And I've added these captions on each one of these to explain what this is about. And you can just skip the first two pages. And when you're with the Jehovah's Witness, just go directly to these pages and just say, there's one false prophecy. The Watchtower Society claimed to be God's true prophet for today in April 1, 1972. Here's proof that they did that. This is where they said that. Okay, you guys can read through this. I'm going to go through here quickly. Exhibit 2. Watchtower Society claimed to be God's true prophet for today and to receive revelation from angels. Exhibit 3. The Society claims exclusive knowledge of the Bible and discourages members from studying the Bible apart from their own writings. We have that underlined here where they do that. Further, not only do we find that people cannot see the divine plan in applying the Bible by itself, but we see also that if anyone lays the scripture studies aside, even after he has used them, after he has become familiar with them, after he has read them for 10 years, if he then lays them aside and ignores them and looks to the Bible alone, though he has understood his Bible for 10 years, our experience shows that within two years, he goes into darkness. So if you try to read the Bible without their enlightenment on it, you're going to go into darkness is what they teach here. Exhibit four, the society claims to be the only organization that has God's spirit or that can understand the Bible. This is where they said that in the Watchtower of 1973. Exhibit 5, 1889 and 1908, the Society falsely prophesied that the Battle of the Great Day of God Almighty 
had begun and would end in 1914. Here's where they said that. So these are all false prophecies, false declarations. In 1897, the society declared that the Lord Jesus had been present on earth since 1874. Well, we all know that's not true. Every Jehovah's Witness knows that's not true. In 1916, the society declared that the thousand-year reign of Christ had began in 1873. Here's where they said that in their publication. And so we have all of these false prophecies here. In 1920, the society declared that the physical return of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would take place in 1925. They said that in Millions Now Living Will Never Die, page 89 is what this is taken from. 1922, the Society confirmed the 1925 date for the resurrection. Exhibit 10, 1923, they confirmed the 1925 date for the resurrection again, etc., etc. Exhibit 11, 1925, the Society began to back down on its prophecy for 1925 that the end was going to come. They began to back down on that. 1925 is here with great expectation. Christians have looked forward to this year. And he have confidently expected that all members of the body of Christ will be changed to heavenly glory during the year. This may be accomplished. It may not be. In his own due time, God will accomplish his purposes concerning his own people. He, before this, they dogmatically said, this one's going to happen. <laughs> and now they're backing down. Christians should not be so deeply concerned about what may transpire during this year that they would fail to joyfully do what the Lord would have them to do, etc., etc., and here again, in 1925, they're further backing down from their prophecy for 1925. Exhibit 13, 1931, the Society acknowledged disappointment regarding the predicted dates, attempted to deflect criticism by clinging to the dates and reinterpreting the prophecies. You guys can go through and read this. Again, 1931, they prophesied that Armageddon would take place within only a few months. Didn't happen. So these go on and on here. 1954, H.C. H. Covington, who is vice president of the society, admitted under oath in court that the society had promulgated a false prophecy which had to be accepted by society members. They were being sued by some members who had lost big time from their stupid prophecies. That was uh, the case of Walsh versus Clyde in Scotland, November 1954. And uh, here's some other of these. 1968, the society predicted that the year 1975 would be a year of the end of the age. Etc. They're still at it, still making these false prophecies. And then they admitted that prior date setting amounted to false prophesying in 1968 here. Again, 1969, they confirmed 1975 would be the year of the end of the age. They, here they are still going at it. 1974, the Society condoned member preparations for 1975, getting rid of possessions and making special sacrifices. How are you using your life? You better be preparing for the end of the age. So... And then they admitted to having made false prophecies in Exhibit 21. And then here's the last one. They reversed a century-old claim to be God's true prophet, finally in 1976. And so that's this document I have for you. So, so yes, the society did later admit to having made false prophecies. But the question to ask the JW and to hone in on is, how can you trust your eternal destiny to a false prophet? Obviously, they're false prophets. How can you trust the society to have properly interpreted the Bible and established the society's doctrine. And they're claiming to be God's prophet in the earth and while issuing very dangerous false prophecies that drastically affected the society's members. And so point one to get across to them while they're there, while, they're, while they will listen, is that they have been deceived by false prophets, by frauds and liars, who have issued multiple false prophecies with predicted events that did not come to pass. They've also intentionally corrupted the Bible and that intentional corruption of the Bible is covered on page two of that handout, the back side of that cover page. But my suggestion is that if you can get them to take the handout with them, they can perhaps find these things and read them, read that page later. So point one is that they've been deceived by false prophets. Point two then is that while the JWs say they believe in only one God, if their Bible is right, then they actually are polytheists who have to believe in multiple gods. In order to get to this point, uh, ask a JW how many gods he believes in. They'll probably say only one. At which point, ask them what their Bible says at John 1 and verse 1, which is the main text for this point. And we've turned to John 1 in our Bibles, which says this at John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Watchtower translation at this verse instead says as follows. 
In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word, bracket, Christ, was a God. Was a God. And search that little one-letter word A there before God. But that little one-letter word changes the entire meaning of the verse. And also the JW is required understanding of how many gods there are. Society teaches that because there is no definite article in the reference to Christ as the God, it doesn't say hotheos, they say, therefore, He is not the Almighty God like the Father is. Jesus is not the Almighty God like the Father is. And I've heard them say that to me. They say He is God-like. He is a divine being or a lesser God. That's what they say. So at that point, I, asked, I like to ask the JW, well then, is Jesus a true God or a false God? You say He's a God. Is He a true God or a false God? Don't let Him change the subject because He's going to try to. Make Him answer the question, is He a true God or a false God? Then ask him how many gods he believes in. If a smart JW who knows where you're headed here dares to say he believes in more than one God, then bypass John chapter 1 and ask the JW what his Bible says at Isaiah 43 in verse 10, where the King James Bible says, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord. Their Bible says Jehovah. Ye are my witnesses, saith Jehovah. And my servant whom I have chosen that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. Read that same thing in Isaiah 44. point to make in this verse is that true witnesses for Jehovah understand that there is only one true God. Only one true God. At that point, I like to ask J.W. if the Lord Jesus is their Savior. They typically say yes, of course, 23 times in the New Testament. The Lord Jesus is called the Savior. And then I show them the next verse here in Isaiah 43, where Jehovah says, I, even I am the Lord, I am Jehovah. Beside me there is no Savior. There's no Savior beside Jehovah. At that point I ask, does not this passage teach that, does it not teach that Jesus is Jehovah? They may ramble a bit with a canned explanation, but then keeping a marker in Isaiah 43, go back to John chapter 1 and go through the steps I just outlined. Ask the JW if Jesus is a true God or a false God. Don't let him change the subject. Make him answer the question. And then read down a couple more verses in John chapter 1, where it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. At that point, you can ask if Jesus is the Creator God. Doesn't that say that Jesus is the Creator God? The Watchtower Version actually may insert the word other in verse 3, as it does in Colossians 1.16. Colossians 1.16, where our Bible says as follows, Colossians 1.16, For by Him were all things created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by Him and for Him. That's what our Bible says. The J.W.'s Bible says at this verse as follows, by means of him, all, bracket, other things were created in heavens and upon the earth, visible things and the invisible, no matter whether they are thrones or lordships or governments or authorities. It says all other things have been created through him and for him. Inserting into that verse twice that word other. That's covered on page two of the handout I had up on the screen. The society's own interlinear Bible says that the Greek word panta here means all things, not all other things. They inserted that word other in there. There's no basis for that in the Greek. Here again, the New World Translation deliberately mistranslates this verse to make it appear that Christ was a created being who was then used by God to create all other things. The passage clearly says Jesus created all things and therefore is the creator. He's not a created being. And at this point, I'd take the JW back to Isaiah 43. But we read in Isaiah 43, verse 15, I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Then turn over to the next chapter, Isaiah 44, where we read in verse 24, Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretched forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. By myself he did all these things. 
Question for the JW. Don't these verses in Isaiah 43 and 44 in fact say that Jesus is Jehovah? That brings me to point three. Again, point one is that the JWs have been deceived by false prophets, frauds, and liars. Point two is that while they say they believe in only one God, if their Bible is right, they have to believe they have to be polytheists who believe in multiple gods. Point three is that Jesus is Jehovah. And unless they repent and believe that Jesus is Jehovah, they are, in fact, dead in their sins and on their way to hell. To get to this point, I go back to the book of John, this time to chapter 8, John chapter 8, where we read John 8, verse 58. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Verse 59 then says, Then they took up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Let the JW read both of those verses together. And then ask the JW why the Jews picked up stones to stone him. After they give their answer, then give them the right answer, which is that they picked up stones to stone Jesus here because they knew Jesus was claiming by this statement to be the same I am, the same Jehovah, that appeared to Moses in the burning bush. And then show them verse 24 of the same chapter, where Jesus said, I said unto you therefore, John 8, 24, I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am, I am he, ye shall die in your sins. That he there is in italics because it's inserted into the text. Jesus here is again claiming in both of these verses, verse 58 and also here in verse 24, to be Jehovah, just as we read in Isaiah 43 and 44. And, of course, many other places as I get into in the other handout I'll send you. Jesus is claiming here in verse 58 and here also in verse 24 to be Jehovah, just as we read in Isaiah 43 and 44. And unless they repent of their false gospel and believe that themselves, they too are dead in their sins, meaning they're on their way to the same fiery hell that Jesus also preached about. At that point, you've lost your audience, and uh, all you can do is hope that you planted some seeds and given them some things to ponder. This is how I suggest witnessing to Jehovah's Witnesses. If you haven't lost your audience at that point, you can pull out the other handout and can continue with this exercise with them. I'm going to go ahead and briefly share with you. I'll just show it to you really briefly here. I've got this document also. This is the one I have already actually handed out before a few years ago. But this goes through these seven points I mentioned earlier. One, the Watchtower Society does not speak for God. Two, the New World Translation is a deliberate deception. Three, Jehovah is not God's only name. Four, salvation is by grace through faith alone, not of man's works or efforts. Five, the biblical God is a trinity. Six, Jesus is Jehovah. Seventh, there is one people of God, not two peoples, but two different destinies. And so it explains how you can witness to Jehovah's Witnesses from all of these all of these verses and all of these points. These are all some good points that you can study up on. I would recommend that you do that and uh, prepare yourself to witness to false Jehovah's Witnesses as we try to magnify Christ in our daily dealings with others. I am also going to end the message on that point. So, on that note, let's go ahead and say a word of prayer and we'll close the meeting. Let's, uh, let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord God, we do thank you for your word. Help us, Lord, to learn, learn how to contend earnestly for the faith once delivered. Help us to prepare ourselves to be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks us a reason for the hope that is in us. Please, Lord, help us to determine to prepare ourselves to do these things and to really have a heart uh, to prioritize speaking up for Jesus and magnifying him by the things that we do and say, please give us a burden, Lord, to preach the gospel for those who need to hear it. Thank you for this meeting today. Thank you for all that were here. We love you, Lord, and we praise you. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.